we hope that their leadership takes the right decision. But the deal we'll accept is they end their nuclear program. None of those measures include closing any of our facilities. The proud people of Iran would never accept that. We absolutely made no concessions uh, on our bottom lines, and that is the only thing that's important here. President Obama is setting a tough marker for a nuclear deal with Iran during a 2012 presidential debate. But Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif and State Department spokesperson Marie Harp putting very different spin this week on the framework deal that's actually been agreed to. And it's time now for our Sunday group. Syndicated columnist George Will, Mara Liason from National Public Radio, Jason Riley of the Wall Street Journal and Fox News political analyst Juan Williams. Well, as we say, President Obama started out with a firm red line, if you will, that Iran must end its nuclear program. We're obviously a long way from there. George, there are obviously concessions in any negotiation. Did President Obama and the West give up too much, or is this a reasonable deal? Well, what was given up that really matters was given up a while ago. That is, we conceded the right to enrich, the capacity to enrich, and the possession of some low-enriched uranium. This deal comes in the fourth quarter of an Obama presidency that has been characterized in foreign policy by four failures. The failure to leave a stable Iraq, the failure of the Russian reset, the failure to advance the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, and the failure to suppress the proliferation of al-Qaeda's emulators and franchises, if you will. And so we went into this with a kind of asymmetry of urgency. The president wanted to stop the, the Iranian bomb, but he really wanted a deal that could be presented as revolutionary for the whole region. The Iranians wanted to lighten the sanctions, but they really want a nuclear weapon. And I think that's the asymmetry that defines this process. We asked you for questions for the panel, and we got sharply different reactions on Facebook. Bill Farrow asked, why would anyone who had Iran struggling because of the embargo take such a weak stance in negotiations? But Mary Ann Arlotto writes, Kerry did the best he could. There is no way Iran will give up this program. Juan, how do you answer Bill and Mary Ann? Well, I don't think it's so much about concessions, uh, especially to Bill's question. I think that it really is about commitments. And what we've got here is Iran was forced to the bargaining table by the sanctions. And remember, the sanctions bill, the sanctions are imposed by an international community, not the United States alone. So unless you have the whole group, plus I might add places like Japan, India, Pakistan, not buying oil from Iran, if that broke down, then just U.S. sanctions would not have been sufficient to continue this, and Iran would have continued building their nuclear weapons. Right now, I think, the estimate it would take three months for them to have breakout capacity, to have nuclear weaponry. Under this current deal, it looks like it would be about a year. And you have a 15-year time frame in terms of inspections, which are unprecedented. So I think it's, it's, there were some concessions, as you say, but this, to me, and I might, you know, if you're saying, hey, Juan, you, you tend to be more Democratic than Republicans. Take a look at the Wall Street Journal. They're saying it, too. This is a useful deal. That is the perfect segue <laughs> to Jason Riley because, in fact, I have to say I was a little bit surprised. The Wall Street Journal editorial page, which is generally no fan of President Obama, I thought was surprisingly mild in its reaction to the deal, saying that there were useful limits on Iran's nuclear infrastructure, but that enforcement and inspections uh, needed to be stepped up. So right. the question, right. I guess, is, Jason, can this deal be saved? Um, I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm very skeptical. Um, it is all about the enforcement, and Iran has a perfect record of violating every inspection agreement. And I don't think that these snapback provisions are, are you know, they're easier said than done. Let, Partly, let, let me just quickly explain what, what the agreement says in this word snapback, yeah. I must say I'd never heard before, is that their sanctions would be lifted, but if there's any violation, that they, quote, snap back. Right, but we're farming out the inspections to U.N. officials. Uh, once those sanctions are lifted, you're going to have companies in Asia and Europe going in to cut deals with Iran. And then there will be tremendous pressure to keep those deals in place. 
snapback provisions or no snapback provisions because there will be an economic interest from those countries to keep those uh, keep that business going. So once we lift these sanctions, I think it'll be very hard to get back to where we are now. I'd also add that you know neither President Obama or uh, the Iran foreign minister mentioned that the Fordo facility was built secretly underground, which of course is where you build a facility when you have peaceful means in mind for how it will be used. I mean, so w w I, I don't think, again, that, that we can expect Iran to keep up its end of the bargain here. They have no, we have no reason to believe that they will do so based on their history. Meanwhile, we, I want to talk about another foreign policy development this week. We had this horrific attack uh, by terrorists on deliberately targeting Christians at a college in Kenya. And meanwhile, the civil war in Yemen just continues to, to spiral out of control. I want to play a, a, a clip from President Obama from just a little bit more than six months ago. The strategy of taking out terrorists who threaten us while supporting partners on the front lines is one that we have successfully pursued in Yemen and Somalia for years. Mara, do White House officials acknowledge that their lighter footprint counterterrorism strategy isn't working? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, George listed all the foreign policy failures. I can't remember if Yemen was in there or not, but it is certainly one of them. And um, the world looks like it's on fire, and ISIS and its imitators are growing. And not necessarily in Kenya, but in a lot of places in the Middle East, Iran is part of this conflict and seems to be growing stronger every day. So that's a real challenge for the White House. I mean, what is it going to do about this? It's not a matter of root causes, economic, you know, lack of economic opportunity. More and more, this looks like a religious war, you know, going in and indiscriminately killing people who are of the other religion. And uh, but, it's but a I huge problem. The question I'm asking is that, and I don't mean sort of the gotcha of they said it as a success and it wasn't, but they had. A strategy, which was the kind of lighter well, they've footprint. They already adjusted that lighter footprint in Afghanistan. Remember, we were they're going to pull out faster, more troops. They've agreed to keep about as many troops as their military advisors wanted to. So I do think there's a kind of adjustment. I don't know what they do in places like Yemen, where they're, they're literally falling apart and they had to pull out their counterterrorism troops. But they are adjusting, and the footprint is getting a little less light. George, I, I was also struck by President Obama's statement this week about the terror attack in, in Kenya. Let's put this up on the screen. He condemned a terror attack, quote, where innocent men and women were brazenly and brutally massacred. He never once mentioned the fact that it was Christians who were deliberately targeted. Yes, these innocent people were guilty in the eyes of their killers of being Christians. But this is of a piece with the administration's mincing vocabulary as it kind of tiptoes on eggshells to avoid saying that there is a, a religious, irreducibly religious dimension to this conflict. They want, they've tried to avoid this, but the facts keep rearing their ugly heads. Juan, how do you explain that? I mean, on the one hand, when their attackers are clearly Islamic radicals, violent Islamic radicals, they don't want to say that. And when it's Christians who are the target, the president doesn't want to say that. Well, he should say it because it's pretty obvious. And I don't think there's any getting away from the religious dimension. You look at what ISIS has done when they beheaded those Coptic Christians, if you recall, Chris. And remember that now that we have a situation where they have been pushing Christians out of uh, Iraq, you know, kind of ancient homeland of Christianity. So I don't think there's any question. Now, let me just say this. These radical, violent Muslim extremists also kill Muslims in greater numbers than they kill Christians. So you have to take that into account. And in the case of Kenya, I think it's quite clear they want to foment a religious war, as Mari was saying, in Kenya because most of Kenya is Christian. So they see it as a way to destabilize that society, delegitimize the government, and create the kind of anarchy that they see. But if it's a religious war, it might help to acknowledge it's a I religious it's, war. I mean, it's, if, if you think it's going to have some kind of strategic value, I think in the president's mind, not my mind speaking here, uh, but I think in the president's mind, you don't want to say to the Muslim world that this is a war against all of Islam. Well, I don't think we'd ever would say that. Right, that's I mean, right. So you know, we, haven't, we haven't ever said that. Uh, Jason, let me finish with you. On, 
Going back to this question of Iran, uh, there is some talk at the White House, perhaps you make a deal with Iran and this begins to open up a new chapter, there's more engagement, there's less isolation, it'll change Iran's behavior. The flip side of it is we're going to be giving them billions of dollars more, as uh, Senator Corker mentioned, which only boosts their economy and their ability to be a bad actor. Well, I, I, I think w one way to look at this in terms of whether we conceded too much is to look at who's cheering the agreement and who's not. Why are our adversaries more excited about this deal than our strategic allies, like France and Saudi Arabia and the rest of, 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 of the Sunnis and the Arab states, as well as Israel? All right. We have to take a break here. 